Welcome to the session at Atlassian Summit 2020. My name is Greg Warner and I'm the Senior Atlassian Administrator at Splunk. Today's topic, Too Big to Fail, Scaling Systems the Smart Way at Splunk, will take you through our journey of the last eight to nine months as we grew. So first, on the agenda, I'm gonna set the scene talking about our environment and the sort of things we had to deal with, the reason that we had, it was time to act and make those improvements, the changes that we had to make to get there, and finally the results. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an Atlassian customer and have, have been for 14 years. I've managed uh, large installations of data set products, not only at Splunk, but at other organizations. Uh, and I wrote the questions for the Atlassian certification program, ACP 500. A bit about Splunk. Uh, Splunk builds software for monitoring, searching, analyzing machine generated data. Uh, specifically, that's done by ingesting uh, log files and then storing that as uh, searchable indexes. Uh, and that's used in IT operations, security, Internet of Things, and in business analytics. So let's get to our environment. Well, uh, we use the data center products of Jira, Confluence, and Bitbucket. In uh, Jira, we have a little over 1 million issues in 470 projects. Confluence is 140 spaces and 600,000 pages. And in Bitbucket, the majority of our code base is stored in 9,000 repositories. So Splunk has been using uh, Atlassian data center products for many years. Um, and over that time, there'd really been no significant change in over two years. The products had been installed and configured as a, a, during a project with IT operations uh, and largely left, left running as they were. So a lot of de design decisions were several years old. But without significant changes in over two years and trying to combat a significant technical debt, the, the products were out of support and both end of life. But our environment is not particularly difficult or complex. Uh, it's implemented as per Atlassian's documentation. We have a single F5 load balancer, uh, four cluster nodes, whether it be Jira, Confluence, or Bitbucket. Uh, we use a Postgres database server and then a shared uh, file system on uh, NetApp appliances. So there's nothing really custom about it. It's, no, there's no, it's not complex at all. But the combination of staffing changes uh, over the years, as well as uh, using the external partners, consultants for maintenance, meant that we'd really lost the ability to execute change. Uh, any modifications were always done as, as, as like transactional, right? So just one piece at a time, but there wasn't any holistic view of the, of the entire environment. Now, the thing about this is that specifically Jira, Jira is used by everyone in the organization. We have integrations that go to Salesforce, integrations that go to AHA, and it's also used by our, our site reliability engineering for our, our cloud products. So whether you, so it doesn't matter what department you're in, you're always gonna come across uh, uses of, of Jira and Jira Service Desk. And for that reason, having your colleagues being your customers is always this fear of breaking something. And if you broke something, you'd be breaking it for everyone. But so what, right? So if you're using old software and it's, and it's doing what it was designed to do several years ago, what does it matter? Well, one of the things though is that you're paying for improvements and features that Lassian's built that we couldn't use. And you know, in, a, in a software company, our engineers would always look at what's the, the, the latest features and function set available in the documentation from Atlassian. Uh, and they'd see these things that they'd like to use, but we couldn't give them to them because we're using an old version. There was also this concern that, that minor changes would carry significant risk. If you didn't have the holistic view of the, entire, the whole environment, what happens if you make a small configuration change here or you upgrade an add-on over there? And so every time that this would happen, it would always be what would happen if we broke something? But all of that though leads to one thing and that's a frustrating end user experience. Like put your shoes in, in your own customers and colleagues who want to use this new feature and you just can't deliver it to them, let alone problems with performance. And we certainly had that. As a sample of some of the things we saw in our Slack channels, it was people seeing errors coming from Bitbucket. We've had people that say it's slow. People have problems with search or they see that the UI is down. Um, to one of the more embarrassing things is when your customers like, spell it out to you that, you know, why don't you put this on a dashboard so that everyone can see it? Like it would be useful to do that and then send our alerts to, to Victrop. Victrop uh, is a, a product that, that we developed that's much like PagerDuty. Um, and so seeing those things, right, Kind of led, led us to where we needed to be. But I guess for me though, yeah, having, having the experience in these products is in week two, 
I decided, okay, we need to add some scale to where we are today. We've only got two Jira nodes, and we need to get that to four. So I built those two nodes, and as I've done before, I added them progressively to production. Of course, after verifying and staging. But in week two at a new job, and a simple thing like that, followed by an update of an add-on, caused a two-hour outage. And I was absolutely mortified. And this happened in the middle of the day. What was even scarier, though, is when I did this. Is Okay, let's have a look at our monitoring and see what do we have that is working. And we had very little coverage in monitoring. And I'm sitting on a conference call with my ITOPS colleagues, pinging hosts to find out what's alive and what's not, and tell them to ports to see if they're open. And I thought, that's absolutely terrible. But what's more embarrassing, though, is on our website. The answer to our problems is right there. And we weren't doing what we, had to, what we, were, what we should have been doing. So the takeaway from that, right, is understand what you have and where you are. Um, this was probably all right two years ago, but we had to review the decisions of the past. You know, always with, with software, things are always made with compromises at some point. And so, right, and so what we really looked at is, okay, this was two years ago. The company has grown. It's grown substantially in that time. We're scaling out. It's now we have to do something about it. And for me, when I, when I was putting this talk together, it was certainly thinking about what it felt like when I was talking to ITOPS colleagues and we're pinging hosts that we had to do something about it. So from here, now it's time to act. We need to do something about this. We need to make it, we need to make improvements because I don't want to keep coming to work like this every day where we're dealing with these ongoing problems and poor user experience. But one thing we did have was really good configuration control. The configuration of the environment is uh, all managed in Ansible, and we manage these as uh, roles and tasks. So the reason it was really easy for me to build two new nodes in that environment without, you know, in the second week of the job was that I could follow our Ansible playbooks and deploy really easily. So on the positive side, we had that covered. We had really good configuration control. But what we really didn't have is we didn't have insights. We didn't actually know what was going on. We knew that, that things were running and we knew that they weren't running when people started to ping us in our Slack channel. So we wrote this down. So, okay, what do we need? So first of all, we needed to have host monitoring. And we know we're going to need to, to do upgrades. And to do that, we're going to need to write automated performance tests. Let's get away from the past where we do an upgrade and then someone would click around the screen and just say, yep, can I create an issue? Can I create a conference page? Can I clone a Bitbucket? Let's actually think about what we're going to need to do in the future. This is one of those scaling challenges, right? It's, 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 this isn't just going to be the one upgrade. We are going to do many upgrades in the future to maintain current on every version. So we need to start to write those automated performance tests. And once we've done that, the next thing is application performance monitoring. How are our systems running so that we can continue to make them performant in the future? So a little bit on host monitoring. There are plenty of options you can do for basic host monitoring that don't cost the earth. Uh, for us, uh, this is CheckMK. So this is straight out of the box. There's nothing special here about CheckMK. CheckMK had been used for a long time uh, within our organization by ITOps. So I said, let's make sure that all of our environment and all of our hosts have the default for CheckMK. And then once that was done, we had an outage and uh, CheckMK said everything was green, but we'd actually had a uh, a JVM crash. So there's one thing that we added in here that's, that's the most beneficial of all of this was this HTTP check Jira status. And what this does is it connects to the host and then does slash status. And the response that comes back is both a HTTP code, in this case HTTP 200, and a JSON response to say whether it's running or it's maintenance. And this allowed us immediately to know that when our hosts are running, are they actively delivering a service? It doesn't matter if your nodes can ping them if they're actually not doing anything. So my, my, my recommendation here is if you're doing host monitoring is set it up with check HTTP status. This is applicable to all of the data center products. Uh, in CheckMK, we make a rule so that when you deploy a server and it's part of a, a host group, that this slash status is automatically checked. So once we've done that, now we're saying, okay, we're gonna be doing these automated testing. Uh, I must admit, for many years, I avoided automated testing just because I thought it would be this enormous time sink that I'm, I'm only going to use a couple times a year. 
but you have to start somewhere. And we started really, really small. We only had three tests to start with. Just to think about like, what are the basic things that we would do uh, during an upgrade if we were just gonna click around the UI? What, what can we do and how quickly can we get there? Uh, when you do these tests, you're not gonna write them all in one hit. So it was always decided that we're gonna just add it on as needed. Uh, certainly I don't wanna spend weeks and months and try and perfect them when we know that we can just get by with a minimum set and then we'll, the next upgrade will include more until eventually one day, maybe we'll have 100% coverage, but I, I don't think so. We'll just keep adding as we needed but ensure that we build on each upgrade. So with any new product feature or any new add-on that's been added, ensure that you've got a new test for it. So look at what, what we did. Um, I started with Locust. Locust was the lowest common denominator that would get us some functionality fast. Uh, and in this one, it, it was simply, in uh, task number one was just get the base URL Task number two, which is added in and say, okay, now once you've logged in, get a dashboard. And then finally, task number three was go and run some JQL. And those three tests still run today. They're still still valid for us. Um, we've got about 30 tests that are now run as, as we've decided to, to get a little bit more into the system and to dig a little bit deeper so that we can run uh, accurate tests and also be able to use that for load balance, uh, load um, profiling. So we can run it double our normal load and see what happens with our current uh, infrastructure. And so when we got a little bit better at our testing, we said, okay, now we need to do, do some more tests with like random uh, creation of Jira issues, for example. Uh, and to do that, we use JMeter. And in JMeter, we have these set as being the same sort of tests, like get dashboard and go and get a project, look at some security levels. Uh, we have a project called JTP, and JTP is the Jira testing project. Uh, this, this project is just used solely for our testing suite to go and create a Jira issue, transition an issue through a workflow, search for those issues, uh, find the releases. Uh, and so the JTP project we created in production. And then whenever we refresh any of our site staging systems, the JTP project is there as well. And so these tests always must must pass, whether it's staging or an alpha environment or something we've set up just for, just for, for demonstrations. Uh, and so these ones took a bit longer to build, but uh, this is now sort of where we're going with our without testing once we, we, we finish with Locus. But as I, as I said before though, like write tests, no matter how small they are, you just have to have something rather than nothing. And this will help with every future change. So I, I mentioned about upgrades and we use these tests, but we also use them when we do add-ons. So I mentioned before about Locus, and we can run that at double the normal load. We can do the same thing with, with JMeter. But we can also do checks now where when we have good governance and we check to make sure that an add-on doesn't affect the performance, we'll upgrade the add-on and then run the performance tests to make sure that we haven't gone backwards. And we compare the results over versions and we'll do it whenever we make a configuration change. And so even though it might seem like a, like a lot of work just to get started with something, this is what I mean, like every time you do a change and not just an upgrade, you can run those performance tests over and over again and see how you're doing over time. So we had all that, right? And so we, we've, we've getting ready for the upgrades. Now it was actually finally time to make that change. Now, I find with change, the technology side is generally pretty easy, right? That, that's something that you can control and you've got some predictability about it, but it's the, the people in the ch aspect, right? And so in our environment, it had been static for a long time. It had been the same user interface and, and the same features now. And now I'm saying we're gonna shake it up and we're gonna, gonna do something new. And certainly we had these conversations where people say, well, are you really sure you're gonna do it today? Or are you really gonna go ahead and do it? And it's absolutely, we're gonna push forward to do it. And, and even to my manager, I told him before we made any of these changes, there is going to be some pain. But when we get through this in a few months, you look back at it and say, it's absolutely worthwhile to do it. And to finally push through this, this inertia or this change paralysis. Uh, when I wrote up the change requests to upgrade for Jira, um, this was the first change request that our change advisory board had seen in years to do with Jira. And I, I knew this could possibly be, a, be one, of the, one of the areas where people would, would really question, have we really dotted our I's and crossed our T's? And so it's probably one of the most detailed change requests I've ever written. And it covered things like the upgrade process, how the playbooks were going to be run, what the automated tests had told us, and it answered every question that everyone had 
about were we ready to do this and what happens if it can go wrong. And certainly I was saying, well, what happens if it goes right? So the, ch the upgrade that we did was uh, from 7.3 to 7.13.3. Uh, we did that so that we, we stayed within the, the major version, but it involved really just one person, and that one person was me. Um, the reason that is that people are just unsure, like, okay, well, you know, you know this stuff, we'll let you go ahead and do the upgrade. Um, but, you know, I, I'd, I'd done this actually just before I I'd joined, uh, joined Spark. I'd done this exact upgrade, so I knew what was what I was, I was expecting. But, you know, as I mentioned before, there are still some unknowns when you come to a new job, a new environment, and certainly it was stressful, it had to be successful. So we did this upgrade and actually it went swimmingly. It was a zero downtime upgrade to minimize um, possible risks that would pop up that I didn't know about. It was done out of hours. And certainly I'd done enough times practicing it, knowing what the steps are going to be uh, and pulled that off without a hitch. But the next thing we had was to do with Bitbucket. And I showed you before those, those Slack screen, uh, screenshots where people come about performance. The thing about that is we were uh, we were getting close to our Splunk user conference and I had some concerns that, you know, if Bitbucket's not working, there's a possibility that product releases at our next user conference might not quite get there. And so rather than propose an upgrade before our user conference, I said, okay, within with my team, I said, look, these are the problems I've identified. I think we can manage these, but we're going to need someone available on call daily who's keeping track of what's going on and that's watching our CheckMK host reporting uh, to ensure that they could they could cut off anything at the pass. Uh, and so we would, every day between 2 and 2.30, we knew that there were some builds that would run that would impact uh, CPU utilization and performance. And so we would nurture this nurture this through. But we knew that once we got past .conf, we got past what was, what was you know, really important to the company, that we would pull this upgrade off. And so the upgrade was to 5.16.10. Uh, again, chose the most recent and the same major version. It had been suggested to us that maybe we just go straight to six, but I was like, no, if we do that, there's some other complications. Let's just get us to something that fixes our current problems, and that was in 5.16.10. Uh, this involved many teams. This wasn't just the Atlassian team and infrastructure team. This went to databases, and it went to release engineering and build systems. And so knowing that, um, I looked at you know, when, when was the lowest amount of use, and the lowest amount of use was nine o'clock on a Friday when we have our company breakfast. So I said to my team, I said, Tim, we are going to do this at nine o'clock on a Friday morning. And suddenly my, my boss was like, that's crazy. Why would you do this in production hours? And I said, well, this is the data that supports that decision. I said, but I'm, I'm cognizant of the other teams that will be impacted. If we do this on a weekend, it's the lowest risk for us, but it's the most inconvenient for everyone else. Uh, for those teams that needed to be on call if something went wrong, well, now they're waiting around for us to upgrade on a weekend. It destroys their weekend. So I said, look, let's set the, the bar really high and let's make sure we do this do this well. Uh, let's make sure we use a lot of automation to get us there so that there's, there's minimal uh, hands that involved that could possibly make something go wrong. And so we did this upgrade, 9 o'clock on a, on a Friday morning, and it took 16 minutes to upgrade four nodes of Bitbucket and have it ready to hand over to our release engineering team. Our release engineering team then ran their automated tests against it, and by 10.30, it was all done, and it was ready to hand back to our, our end users to go ahead and use. And this is probably one of the times I was really proud of my team, where we had set the bar so high from early on to ensure that we had the, the highest quality of work that didn't impact uh, our, our colleagues. Once that was done, the last, the last step was really to, to do a confidence upgrade. And uh, in Confluence, we upgraded to 6.15.7. This was the only one we did that was uh, outside of enterprise release. And that was because um, the versions beyond the enterprise release had a better search and closed a bug that had caused a problem for us. So um, as a general principle, I generally don't deviate much from enterprise releases. Those enterprise releases are you know, tried and true and enterprise support has a lot of information about those. Um, but yeah, in this, in this case, we just went just beyond. Um, I always ensure just upgrade the recent in the same major version. Just minimizes complications, and particularly when you've, you're you doing the first upgrade after many years, uh, this certainly de-risks it. Uh, this involved many people on my team. So now having having some confidence after a successful Jira upgrade, a successful Bitbucket upgrade, 
now other people are putting up their hands to to be involved. I guess at this point too is is we started to involve some Atlassians as well. So Splunk has um, Premier support, and we use Premier support almost daily to to help us root cause just about anything we ever see, and and also ask for configuration guidance. Uh, and and this year we also added uh, the technical account manager, the TAM program. And it was actually the TAM that actually said to us, you know, when you do these upgrades, have you considered having Premier Support review and do a health check first? And I'd never actually considered that as a function of Premier Support. I, I always saw it as reactionary and not something that would be planned. And in this case, we certainly now in, include Premier Support in our upgrades, not just telling them we're doing an upgrade and are you available if something goes wrong, but also can you have a look at what could be something that can go wrong? And when we go to a new version, do you have any data that tells us when we get there, what things we could be looking out for. Uh, so this is not another successful upgrade. Um, again, successful, but plenty of unknowns. Um, but to, to really break the, the paralysis, we sort of had to say, but let's just push forward. We know something's going to break, but we're going to be on a new version with new features that people want and bugs that have been closed out. But then there's always these chance meetings that, uh, that we have. And so one day, um, there's a team that sits across from me called Splunk and Splunk. And Splunk and Splunk had said, can we have a meeting with you? We'd really like to make sure that we are using Splunk at Splunk to monitor our own things. And they came across and said, look, we want to do application performance monitoring on your on your services. And so they asked me, what what should what should we be monitoring just to ensure we've got coverage? And I already had an idea of about 10 things just based on previous experience and previous other jobs that I'd, I'd worked where I needed to monitor. But I said, you know, I'm just going to go review what Atlassian says. And Atlassian does have a posting that Premier Support has written that of the things that you should monitor in a data center environment. And so I gave them, just monitor these. And the thing that happened next was, was well, spectacular, was that the, the application performance monitoring provided a biggest leap of the things that we could do and the confidence we later have. So what does that look like? So it shouldn't come as any surprise that we use Splunk at Splunk to monitor this. And this is an example of our Atlassian overview. So going back to those those Slack messages where people were constantly saying, simply is your service up? We now had a dashboard in our own product that showed you it was available and how many users there are. And it would allow people to dive a little bit deeper if they wanted to. Early on, we were a little bit, a little bit reluctant saying, well, we know we're not running at 100%, but I think we need to be accountable. So we made that available to all and for uh, more detailed uh, metrics into our systems. So an example of that is is here. This is uh, for our uh, Jira environment where we show both our service availability and our users are connected uh, and share with them some of the things like, you know, are we getting errors? Uh, what sort of hit rate do we have? And what's the response time across each of our nodes? For, for people who are moving from server to data center, you may not be considering these things because you're working with a, a single a single haystack, a single, a single server. So when you start to move to a multi-node cluster, it's really important to start to get an idea about how is that cluster beha behaving? Are uh, the load balancing algorithms you're using, are they actually doing what you're expecting them to do? And so for this, we monitor things like the number of hits per minute each of the nodes gets, the response time of each, and the traffic that's, that's coming from each of those nodes. And we put it in these graphs to actually show on each of the nodes what happens. You've seen that in the bottom graph, that's our, our HTTP hits that we have on each of our nodes. And you'll see there's these little spikes every, on the hour. So we started to see that we had some end users running automated services that would spike every hour. Uh, and that started to give us some idea about how people were using using our services. But also come up with other little things that we didn't know about. Uh, this is showing the number of users uh, during the course of a workday. Um, we're always looking for times, when would it be a good time to make a change or do something that would we just so we could de-risk it just a little bit. Uh, this is an example where we have this dip here on the graph at uh, at 11:30. Now uh, that's company lunch, so people have gone to lunch at the point and it dips down. And so we said, look, if we were going to do a change that that needed to happen in the daytime, where would we do it? And we used the the data that we had that was being fed in uh, from Splunk to tell us that 11:30 would be the best time to go ahead and do that. But it's not just during the day and during operations that we would use this. We also make sure we use it during upgrades. So during that uh, that Bitbucket upgrade I mentioned before, it all went it all went pretty swimmingly, and then one of my team members noticed in our logging that there's this high error rate. Uh, so one of the the log files we ingest is the is the error log in Bitbucket. 
and following the tests, uh, following, the, following the upgrade, had this spike of errors. Now, it went on for a while, and we sort of looked at it, and we just shifted the time series and, and uh, located that the error started exactly when the upgrade completed. And so we looked at it and went, okay, so you actually can click in on the error and find out what it is. And it turns out, somewhere in the last two years, uh, someone had added a uh, post commit script that checked for large files being committed into our repositories. And during the upgrade, that hadn't been committed or, or, and, and delivered as part of our, our configuration. So we had to go back in the backups and then uh, add that file. And we added that file at uh, 12 o'clock, committed it, and then run, ran our Ansible playbooks. And you can see where it made a difference, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that we use it for identifying errors and correcting them. And this one here could have gone on for months without someone picking it up. And it probably would have happened when a large file got committed and suddenly caused another problem. So the, operationally, it provides us the ability to, to review after upgrades to ensure that have we modified something in the environment. So now that we've got these dashboards, dashboards visible, they go all the way up our management line to, to our C-level executives. And so most recently, uh, we were trying to troubleshoot a problem with performance in uh, JIRA. And we identified where it was. It was to do with uh, CPU allocation and, and resources. And I submitted a change request to our change advisory board with all the data that we had coming from our Splunk reporting that said that this is, this is where it's going to be. Um, but that particular database server hadn't had any changes made to it in 768 days. So we wanted to be sure that we had got this right. This was going to cause a company outage when we did this. We had to restart a database server and, and the application nodes couldn't connect to it. Uh, but it was going to happen during a, a freeze, window, freeze window to do with uh, end of quarter. And so I sent so I send it off and, and got told that I need to get um, our CIO to approve it. And I sent it off to him and he replied back with this. And I didn't realize that uh, that he actually kept such a, such a, a tight look on, on how things are running. And he said, yes, I approve it for this reason. Uh, so this is using uh, one of our products called ITSI. Uh, and it presents KPIs and metrics to management, in this case, C-level executives, uh, about how this, is, how this is performing. And he certainly tells me he reviews this uh, two or three times a day just to find out how is the environment performing for all of those in the company that use it. So we've done some changes, we did those upgrades, and it's at this point now that we talk about results. So let's just compare a before and after. So before, change was really hard. Even though we had configuration control, just breaking the mold and sort of pushing forward was always met with resistance because we didn't have a really good understanding. Uh, after though, the change is really frequent because we had we, we knew how to do this now, we had some confidence to go for it. And we now we have this confidence of change. Um, we, we could do this and we encourage my peers to find improvements. If we can do change often and change isn't hard, then I always encourage my team to find, you know, find those one percenters, like find those little changes you can do that will deliver a much better environment, not just in reliability, but for day to day. Uh, and when we look at before, we had very little understanding of our environment. When I look back at it now, I really wonder how we, how we could even run as we did because we had such little way in the monitoring and observability that it made it really difficult to, to ever know whether you were performing or not. Um, and then I compare it afterwards, right, with our dashboards and our Splunk reporting about how the excellent operational insights. And so I showed before where we were, we were, had one in Amber. So this, again, coming back to, to ITSI, now IT Service Intelligence, this is what um, our management sees now. Uh, it's all green. And I guess one thing to, to point out here is that, I get back to the Alaskan suite is so important to the business that we're up there, right up there with enterprise email and our imports and exchange uh, about running those services. And this is the, the top 50 services reported to uh, our executive team about how it's performing. So they don't need to contact someone and say, you know, give some um, subjective, like how is Jira to you or how is Bitbucket for you? Uh, we, we report this up and we're quite proud of of ensuring that these are always green uh, and we'll always go and find the root cause if they're not. So this is how we do it in Splunk. I'm using uh, Splunk Cloud specifically for this. Um, the next leap though, and this is this is what I call like our, our, our next generation, is now we use uh, SignalFX to do it as well. Uh, SignalFX is an acquisition that, uh, that Splunk made last year and it was able to get me some of the 
the real time metrics that uh, I hadn't had in uh, in uh, Splunk previously. So we make sure we graph uh, all of our application utilization, network traffic, number of nodes that are active. Uh, and where this gets really useful though is is the time series data. So I mentioned before about changing those resources. And so if we look back 21 days, about what, what did it look like 21 days ago? And you can see in the bottom left, those triangles indicate where alerts have been sent to on-call. And so as we move across our graphs, it shows the the time comparison to the other items we're managing. So the network traffic and application utilization. And you can see uh, in the, the right-hand graph, the CPU utilization regularly would be above 15 to 100 percent and we made that change and then it went to zero and that really just confirmed some of the hypothesis we made on our uh, where this where this problem is happening and, and resource contention and we have these we have alerts that we, we set up now so that we can uh, get to these in advance uh, on we do the same for confluence so we, we uh, graph out things like page content and content notifications uh, this became really important uh, at the uh, end of our last quarter and our last financial year uh, when uh, Confluence was generating 10 times the normal mail volume of a regular day. Uh, it turns out to be that it was genuine user-generated traffic, um, but we had metrics and, and, and data to support it we would do. And so we now make sure that we have alerts for uh, anomalies. And in this case, uh, this is looking at one of our uh, alerts coming from SignalFX that looks at uh, alerts that would be triggered on this graph uh, by the by red arrow. Um, based on historical anomalies. So we don't use static numbers anymore. We, as we grow, we need to ensure that our alerts grow with us. And so one of the problems that we had uh, early on with our check and carry monitoring was that it looked at how things performed two years ago. Now, a lot of things have changed in then. We've, we've grown substantially. So we would either have alerts that fired too regularly, in which case it just became noise and we just deleted them and moved on. And we didn't really look at what it was saying uh, or alerts that didn't fire often enough when we got to critical values. So we now, this is what I mentioned about our next generation of uh, of uh, monitoring is is much more much more proactive. We can do much much more newer functionality with it. So from that though is like you know what are the results? Well, number one is we haven't had any outages since August 2019. Uh, outages were almost a weekly, sometimes daily occurrence. Um, without any root cause for any of those, it's really hard to come down and, and decide what changes can we make and, and what caused it. And so for that reason, um, we make sure we root cause absolutely everything, no matter how trivial it might be. If we have a, uh, a Jira node that becomes unresponsive in the middle of the day and, and we haven't root caused it yet, it's always in the teams like, okay, have you got the support logs out? Have you gone to Splunk and had a look? Have you logged it with premium support? Uh, it may be nothing, but... Uh, we always check every time something uh, is an anomaly in our environment. Uh, on the Bitbucket side, glad to say we have no outages there either. Uh, and certainly no performance problems that we would regularly come across prior to our upgrades. And that's just doing the upgrades alone. Like doing the upgrades and some monitoring, we were able to rule those rule those out. And it's now such an anomaly if people say, if people say oh, their performance is bad or they come up with some sort of error. Uh, as for uh, usability, um, one of the things that we uh, we, we check is our slow queries. These This comes from the slow query log in Jira. Um, there were some queries that people would regularly run that would go for 10, 20 minutes. And that was just normal. That's how, it, that's how it's always been. And by using our reporting and looking at those slow queries logs, we could identify minor configuration changes that we can make. Uh, and to, to get here with the 50% the reduction in slow queries, uh, we would do it on one node, but we'd push the configuration change out to just one node. We'd look at uh, whether that affected the performance and then we'd push it to all the nodes. Uh, and so we'd have we'd have regular confidence that uh, we weren't going to t make major changes and, and take those systems offline. Uh, what else has the, has, the, has it helped us with? Um, we've avoided five confluence outages that regularly that just would have been completely missed. I had the performance degraded or something had was misconfigured. Uh, now we use our, our Splunk reporting to ensure that that we are alerted in advance. Uh, on the cost side of it though, this is probably the one that that we were impressed with most is, is our 75,000 a year license saving. Um, again, like we use uh, we have a lot of automation for our provisioning of our year accounts. 
Um, the, that provisioning dates back three or four years when the company was much different than it used to be. And we just thought about it. So, okay, well, if that's how it used to be, let's go and run our reports and compare the users in our system and the groups where they come from. And identify that we were massively over provisioning accounts in our system. And we only ever found it out when we would reach our license limit and we'd have to go and remove some users. Actually, we decided let's get proactive about it and find out is that provisioning still accurate? Uh, and so we do that with our, our Splunk reporting. But for us, this is really just the, the start of this journey. Um, we've made it a lot more performant and stable and available. We've added new features and functions. Um, and because of that, we've now got the, the confidence to take on uh, bigger projects. But if I could think of one thing, though, that, that having this observability and having um, this ability to search deep into your systems is means that we can embrace change and knowing that we have the timely and correct information and that we know that it isn't just a pinging from the host and hope, and hope that it's that it's going to be that correct. We can search and we can write quite, quite complex queries to ensure that when we're looking for that needle, like when it's on, on a server, it's just a needle in one haystack. But in the case of a four node cluster, it's a needle in four haystacks. Uh, and so rather than writing Perl scripts or um, bash scripts to get there, um, we use our Splunk reporting to make sure that we can we can do that. And we can do that with the confidence to enact change. So that we know that we're not going to break something. We know that we can run those little tests and, and push small changes and, and then see what happens. So that's our story about what how, we, how we've grown and how we've improved as the company continues to scale. And what is it? Like, what should you do like, after you've, you've you've sat through the session? What should you do in your environment? Number one, though, and it doesn't matter which system you're using, whether you're using Chef or Puppet, or I mean, we use Ansible, is ensure that you've got configuration control. And there's been too many times when I've talked to customers using products like this, and I ask them like, how do you how do you build a Jira node? And they say, well, all I do is I download the tarball and I untar it, make the configuration changes, and then off we go. And then it's okay, what do you do for the second node? I'll follow the same steps again, I do it by hand, like, well, that problem's been solved so many times over. So I, I implore you to make sure you've got consistent configuration control. You will use it not just in your production environment, but then when you deploy it to staging to ensure that staging is exactly the same as production. So go and get some configuration control. So we use Ansible, um, it works in our environment, and make sure you choose the right one for you. Uh, the next thing is you know, write some tests. You might not be a software engineer or or do uh, QA. Start to write some tests. Like it doesn't matter how small. Just write something to get started. Certainly, once you've got a few tests and you've got some confidence that they're doing what you expect them to do, you'll start to seek out what are other things I could possibly do. Like now that I've got this 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 new tool in my toolbox, what else is possible? If you're not already, absolutely start host monitoring. So start you know, very basic. You have to have it there so that you know that your hosts are available. Uh, I mentioned before about just adding that one thing, adding slash status to to check those hosts, and then go and do application monitoring. In our case, we use Splunk um, because it's our own product and and that works really well for us. Uh, you might already find you have that, um, but there are other application performance monitoring suites that, uh, that you can also use. But finally, though, after you've got all of that, though, it doesn't matter unless you act on what that data is telling you. If you're getting regular problems and your application performance monitoring tells you that, go and do something about it. And it kind of gets back to number one, right, is that if you know what the problems are, you know how to fix it, and you've got configuration control, you can just make those changes and push them out to those systems knowing that you're not going to break something else. So to absolutely look to, the, look to what the monitoring is telling you and act and make those improvements. Of course, everyone wants to know how they can do this right now. So from the resources, if I just, uh, just recap what I use, uh, Locus is the lowest common denominator for to doing this. Uh, and then uh, SignalFX, uh, again, it's one of our companies um, that is available as a software as a service. Uh, Phonics Punk Cloud is our other product. And then the last thing is, this is the deployment and monitoring strategy written by Atlassian. Uh, and, and so I implore you to go and look at that and understand what sort of things it's monitoring and how you can then uh, implement those. Uh, in SignalFX, if you want to get started, here it is straight up. This is uh, this is our configuration uh, for the the smart agent. Uh, you can take this this code block and drop it in today, and you'll immediately get some of those that that dashboard I was showing you previously. So this will show you 
you know, your Jira issue count, the total number of custom fields, the total number of projects, whether your nodes are active or not, file attachments, and finally the components. And that will get you started on a journey. So I hope that's been, been really useful. Uh, I look forward to seeing next year's talks and hearing about how you have done the exact same in your environment and improved. Thank you.